One, two. Oh, oh my God, amazing. Whoa. So, uh, thank you all for coming here. My name is uh, Alex Shalaev, and we're going to talk today here uh, about functional data structures in Java. So, there's been some changes to the uh, shuttle. Uh, so, the printed versions of the shuttle say that now will be Bruce Tate, and he will not be here. He will be here tomorrow at the same time. So, now you are, you are with me. So, uh, let's, let's talk about functional data structures. Uh, I come from the country, uh, from Estonia, and I work there uh, for the company called Zero Turnaround, where I'm a developer advocate. So, before turning this kind of evangelistic developer advocate uh, into, into this position, I was a developer for some time. But now I mostly care about the community. I try to build relations with developers all over the world. I maintain the blog portal. I participate uh, and try to uh, co-lead the virtual jack, which is an online uh, Java user group, which you should join totally if you haven't yet. And you can find me on Twitter. So uh, this is most that you actually need to know about me. So. Uh, I try to be friendly and amiable. If you have any questions, just find me on, find me on Twitter, and we'll have a decent conversation. So Zero Turnaround is a company that does, does tools for Java developers, mostly productivity tools. Currently, we have two. One is Jarable, which reloads the code changes to your Java application immediately. And the second one is Xrable, which is a performance tool for developers for Java web applications. So if you check them out later, uh, my employer would be happy and will send me to you other conferences again and again. Uh, I will uh, have more chance to uh, talk to you again. So without, without further ado, with all that uh, small details out of our site, uh, let's talk about data structures. And well, naturally, any, any program that we write, any, any application deals with data and manipulates the data. And this is mostly what, what software does. And typically, the data sits in, in some sort of data structure, or you use some sort of collection, uh, either from the JDK library or anything. And there are many, many variations of the, of the collections that are available. So at some point of time, we did the cheat sheet on Java collections. And you can't see probably that on screen, because it's kind of tiny. But I just want to say that it exists. And you should Google that, the Java collection cheat sheet by Rebel Apps, if you uh, would like to get a little bit uh, to know a little bit more about the uh, JDK collections or other libraries that provide cool implementations of the collections. Uh, but this is just basic data structures list, like lists and sets and hash maps and, and so forth. And today we're going to talk and we want to talk about the functional data structures. So, what does functional data structure mean to you. So I run a small Twitter poll just to check if my followers are uh, the brightest people uh, in the community or maybe just uh, funniest. So a functional data structure can mean different things. It can mean that it is not dysfunctional, basically that it's functional correct. It does what it says it does. It can be treated as not imperative or persistent where it just allows mapping functions all over the data in the collections. So just to check if, if I have the same crowd here as in my Twitter follower base, who thinks that the functional data structure means that it is not dysfunctional? Please raise the hand. OK, like three people. It should be not dysfunctional, because we want it to work. Who thinks it's not imperative? More people? Who thinks that it is persistent? It should be obvious. This is a like, foreign word, so it should be, should be true. Who thinks that it allows mapping functions all over the elements in the collections? Who doesn't care and just sits here? <laughs> well, at least you're listening. <laughs> Good. So indeed, the, the, the opinions could be different. And uh, what, what it actually means is that the correct answer in that poll was persistent. But all the other answers are also correct. So the functional data structure should be, should be functionally correct. And it's not, uh, it's not implemented in the imperative way where you mutate the state and just assign things all over again. Uh, and it has to be persistent. 
Uh, and now we'll, in the, in the rest of the time, we'll try to explore the possibilities uh, of using functional data structures uh, on, in your Java code and maybe learn a little bit ab about the trade-offs that they do and how to design them and how to reason about them. So yesterday, yesterday, if you've been here for the test talk, he had an excellent why functional programming matters session. And he explained that any, any paradigm uh, of, of programming it just uh, gives you a different way of thinking about things. So functional usually is synonymous to things like, oh, we'll have immutable values and we'll have laziness and we'll work more with functions rather than objects and we'll have uh, tuples and pattern matching and everything. And he showed how to incorporate this uh, functional style of programming in the, in the code, so to make code more functional. But as we know, in any object-oriented language, Java included, who has Java as the, their main language? Who doesn't write like Scala day to day or I don't know Closure? Who are Java people here? Okay, good. Who are Scala people? Scala developers? Don't be afraid. Two hands. Good. I'm safe. <laughs> so uh, in Java we have objects, and objects have behavior uh, in in the form of methods and data in the form of fields. And both of those components are essential for, for structuring a sensible program, right? So Ted's talk was a little bit more focused on the incorporating functional programming in the behavioral parts of the code, right? How to process the data. And we'll talk about data structures now. So we'll talk about how to store data, what, which means are available to you for you to, to, to do that. And data structures are not a new topic, right? We, I hope most of us have been to school and uh, took some like, computer science courses. And any, any, any kind of that education uh, gives you a glimpse or tries to teach you about data structures. And efficient structures have been studied, well, efficient because we want performance, right? We want our programs to be fast. We, we go an extra mile to make them fast, uh, even at the expense of readability sometimes. So we want things to be efficient. And data structures are very efficient, and uh, like, it's a clear topic. But kind of in a very like, Henry Ford sense of, of efficiency. So uh, to have efficient data structures, programmers can use any language they want, right? because it's an abstract mathematical concept, any language they want until, uh, as long as it's imperative. Right? So we, we will assign the lists uh, and reassign the nodes in the trees. And, and in the imperative language, we know and have all the literature, and we have all the code in the world to show us how to work with that. Not so much with the functional data structures, but they're very interesting. So if we look at the hierarchy of data structures uh, in terms of from mutable to functional, so first we have uh, mutable data structures, and one of the most uh, prominent examples is the JDK collections library. Right? Uh, we encapsulate the state of the uh, structure within the object, and we hide the data, and we provide the methods to control the state of that. And well, you can see that a couple of methods, at least in the collection interface, which governs all the collections in the JDK uh, implementation, uh, a couple of that is uh, void or Boolean methods. And that means that those methods will operate uh, with side effects. Right? And they will mutate the internal state. And that is maybe not the most uh, desirable path for you. Because well, mutating shared state is one way to get like, absolutely mind-boggling concurrency issues in, in, your, in your project when you'll have the global state mutated from different threads. Uh, and maybe this is not the most sophisticated collections that we can have. So when we have mutable collections, naturally the next thing that we have are immutable collections. So they are immutable in the sense that they cannot be modified after the creation, right? So typically in the JDK library, you will have a wrapper that provides you with an unmodifiable view of the collection. So you can retrieve elements from that and see that, but you cannot change anything. And typically it will be implemented in a way that just throw exceptions when you try to do something nasty with it. So the next 
the next level in this hierarchy are persistent data structures. Persistent data structures are that preserve the original version of themselves after you execute uh, update operations on them. So imagine you have this black tree uh, of, of some nodes, and you want to add something, then you will typically have, at the end of that operation, you will have two versions of the data structure available for you. So, and the original one, the previous one that we wanted to mutate, it will still be intact, and it will still be in the same way as before. So you, with persistent data structures, you get kind of snapshotting functionality out of the box. And well, note that for implementing persistent data structures, you don't have to copy like a lot of state. You don't have to copy the full collection all the time. Uh, so you can just modify uh, tiny bits, and that makes it possible to create efficient persistent data structures. And now, the functional data structures are the data structures that are both immutable and persistent. So that means that we would not be able to modify the internal state of that data structure after the creation. And all the operations that we, 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 we execute on that will create us a new version of that structure and keep the original one intact. So the operations on the functional data structure will be referential, transparent. So if you have uh, a statement that executes on the functional data structure and you have the same statement later in the code, they are essentially equivalent because they will return you the same result. Uh, that's what referential transparency is. So now implementing, implementing functional data structures are a bit cumbersome, especially in more uh, imperative languages. So uh, Java as a language, it doesn't exactly force us to be, uh, to write mutable programs, uh, but it doesn't discourage that well, strongly enough, so you can, you can write whatever code you want. But to have functional data structures, you cannot have destructive assignments, so you cannot reassign the values in the nodes, so you can only, only create new things. And you have to have persistence, which means that it's not enough to take the m general collection, mutable collections, as you, as, as you would like, and just create a functional wrapper around that and say, oh, now we will conform to this functional data structure API. If we use that way, we will modify the internal state, and we will lose the persistence, because underlying the collection is still mutable. So we'll have to copy like a lot of things. And that means that to have mutable data structures, oh, sorry, functional data structures, we will have to devise them from scratch, right, from the very beginning. and and do that step by step from the simplest to the, well, as complex as, as, you, as you wish to go. So the simplest data structure that we can do is probably a list, right? It's a, uh, a sequence of elements that go in order. And to build the list in, in the functional manner, manner, you would typically call it cons, uh, and you would have the first element of the list called head, and you will have the rest of the list called tail. And you can have like additional properties like lengths, which will not change because guess what? We are immutable. So once we assign the lengths, it will never, never change. So, uh, and this is basically an implementation of a list, how to do a functional, functional uh, list data structure. You just add elements from the left to the list, and you create a new head if you need. So if you want to prepend an element to a list, since it's immutable, you cannot just say, oh, now my head is a different value. You have to create a new list. So we create a new cons object, and it will give it the new head. And as a tail of that list, we give the full data structure that we had. So that's, that's how you prepare the list. So now you'll have one more element in that order sequence. So if we want to mutate a list and say replace the head with something else, what we will do, we will create a new list that has a different head and the same tail. 
So we, you, when we design functional data structures, what we want to do is we want to reuse as much uh, of, of the existing structure as possible, and we want to introduce just incremental changes to that structure. If we need to change one element in the list, we, would, we, we will need to create a new list, but we, we will reuse the existing data structure to the fullest. So, and that will allow us to, to be persistent, and that will also, also allow us to be, well, efficient. Unfortunately, not, not all operations are as efficient as just pushing a new, new head onto the list. So, for example, if you want to fold the list and to go through all the elements in the list, you still have a way to do that in a functional style. And you provide a function and you provide the accumulator element and you just go through the whole list and, well, you accumulate the result in the accumulator, uh, which is pretty easy, but it will make you think about generics. So if you want generic collections, you will, you will have really fun implementing those. So with this folding strategy, we can now reverse the list. And we go through those operations right now because list is the basic data structure that we have. So when we will need to build more complex data structures, we will have to, well, essentially build them out of lists because currently we, we, we have just a list. So to reverse the list, we will need to go through all the elements in, in, in our left to right and take every element and prepend it to the new list. And we do that in a more imperative manner uh, in the code because, well, this is internal. We do not, we still, we do not modify uh, the state of the existing collections and we use the, the kind of the safe publication. So we do not leak this object until it's fully constructed. So it's still, for the outside world, it is immutable, despite us actually uh, doing something uh, in the beginning, at the creation time. So now we have reverse. The only last thing that we can do with a list now is to attach elements from the other side, right, from the tail. And, well, not surprisingly, since we only have this one directional association of the elements, so every time we get a head and the next list, to add an element from from the right, we will need to go through all the elements uh, in, in one direction and through all the elements back to create the new list. Uh, and this would be an expensive operation. Who thinks it would be expensive operation? Who thinks it will be more expensive than prepending list with an element? Should be more hands. So prepending an element is a very uh, cheap operation. It, it actually takes constant time. We just do a couple of operations, we create a new object, and we, we, we reuse the, all the structure. And that takes constant time. And appending list takes linear time because we have to traverse list back and forth. And when we talk about data structures, we will talk about the efficiency of those, and we'll talk about the algorithmic complexity. And this is a, a, another topic that uh, brings memories from the computer science courses when they tried to teach us, uh, well, the algorithm complexity in analysis of the complexity of the algorithms and, and big O notation. So if you, if you just want to recall that, big O notation uh, gives you an estimate of how the execution time will grow asymptotically as your input grows. So if you have a small list, maybe it doesn't matter how efficient it is, but when you have like a data structure with thousands of elements, you will start uh, getting those penalties for doing ways, uh, things in inefficient ways. So if you have to traverse the list back and forth, and you'll get the linear complexity, uh, as the list grows, the time to execute the operations will grow linearly. If you implement something even with worse uh, complexity, like quadratic or something, then on larger data sets, your code will become unbearably slow. And this is what, what all the like, performance experts typically try to tell developers, that before you go and start to doing like, micro-benchmarks and tuning last bits of performance out of your 
JVM or LTV application, please take a look at what you're doing in the code. Please try to assess the algorithmic complexity of the operations, and maybe, maybe you will get much more visible performance gains from, from rewriting your application code than uh, just tuning the underlying platform. Of course, when you, when you cannot do that, you will have to tune uh, performance, you have to micro-benchmark, you have to tune garbage collection and everything, and that is extremely important. But first, you should definitely look at, at the code. So, and the complexity tells us like, how, how expensive the operation is in terms of performance. So reasoning about individual operations is uh, an, more or less an exact science, and it's very easy to do in the imperative program, because basically in an imperative program we have statements, and that they are executed uh, in a straightforward fashion from top to bottom, and you can assign that this operation takes that much time and this operation takes this much time, and assess the global the global uh, time that a larger operation takes. In a functional setting, it's a bit more cumbersome, especially since of, of it with very many data structures, we'll talk about amortized complexity of the operations. So not just the e exact individual complexity of individual operations, but the complexity of sequences of operations. So the, 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 the point here is that Mm. You will have multiple operations defined. So I, I, imagine we had a list, and we say we will prepend multiple elements to it, and then we will reverse it. And we would want to assess how much time and how complex that batch of operations is on average. And this gives us the ability to uh, better understand the performance of complex data structures. And sometimes data structures which leverage amortized complexities are better and more efficient. So if you want to think about this, imagine we have a list and we prepend n elements to that and then we reverse it. And we want to reason about this whole structure. So this is kind of easy. All the prepends take uh, constant time and then reverse takes linear time. Doesn't help us that much and uh, this reverse being linear uh, doesn't, doesn't help. So we will use something called the banker's method to, to, to estimate the amortized complexity. So the banker's method uh, says the following. Let's say that for all the operations, for all the operations, we'll say that they don't just take the time uh, that they take, but they will, every operation will have a small credit of a, a small performance penalty that it is assigned to that. So, and this is usually denoted by some kind of alpha uh, in the complexity, in the big O notation. So, say every prepend operation doesn't take a constant time, but it takes a constant time plus, some, plus something else. So, when we get to the reverse uh, operation, we, and we add up all those complexities, we'll have the n operations times uh, alpha, because we have n alphas, and we have two n's. So now we will transform this uh, operand in, there, in, in the parentheses. And now, if we, if we think about that, that is the total cost of all those operations, then per operation, if we divide that by n, we will get the amortized complexity of all those operations is 01 plus this small, small, small budget that every operation takes. So it wouldn't be exactly constant time, but it will be efficient uh, under condition that you will do many operations at first, and they will get you the credit that you need, and then you can spend that credit on executing the expensive operation. This is what amortized complexity is. And this is a very cool way to reason about things, except in the functional setting, we have this problem that we keep the past snapshots of of our data structure available. So imagine we, we gain that credit and we do enough of those uh, cheap operations until, until we get enough credit to spend that on a longer operation. And since we execute that and then we, we keep the previous data structure available, somebody can call that expensive operation again and again 
and again. But the thing with credits that are accumulated from those cheap operations is that you can spend them only once. So the second execution of this uh, expensive operation will take time, and that would be detrimental. So you will have to solve this problem. And this, is, this problem is typically solved with, with the ways of evaluating expre uh, expressions in a language. So if we use the strict evaluation and evaluate everything eagerly, then we'll have the problem of this, executing expensive operations again and again and again, and losing that credit. In the same way, if we use the lazy, lazy execution scheme without memoization, without remembering the results of the, of the operations, then we will also be uh, subject uh, to, that, to that penalty. However, if we use the lazy uh, evaluation with memoization, so basically we call the operation and then we remember, oh, next time we call this operation, the result is this, uh, we, we can be very efficient because the subsequent calls to that expensive operations will be very cheap. They will be just, oh, return the result. And this is hard to do, especially with mutable data structures, but luckily, we are talking about functional data structures, so they are immutable, and operations on them are referentially transparent, as we talked before. So we, j we can easily remember the result. If you have an immutable list, the head of that list will be always the same, the same, the same result. How cool is that? So we can overcome this, this complexities of ass assigning and evaluating the amortized complexity of operations, and we can reason about things much better. So, Lazy execution with memoization rules. Let's go back to the data structures. So we have a list, and let's build something more complex out of that list. Let's build a queue. So how do you build a queue when you have a list? Who thinks they have an idea about this? Please raise a hand. Good, you'll learn something new. So when you have a list, this is the only thing you can, you can use. So basically, you create an object queue, and you say that, oh, my, like, my queue, which is the first in, first out uh, data structure, will be modeled on a list. And we will append elements from one side and take the elements from the other side, and we will conform to the functional requirements of, of a queue. And this is obviously a terrible idea, exactly from the standpoint of the performance, because, well, Accessing lists from one side is cheap and constant time and nice and easy, but accessing the list from the other side is very cumbersome because every time we want to append something to a list or take the last element out of the list, we'll have to traverse all that. So instead of constant uh, time operations, we'll have linear time, and that will not be something our, our code will tolerate because usually data structures are at the heart of all the algorithms. So they, they define how you access data, mostly, and, and then you transform that on top of that. So if you, if you do something inefficient that low level in the code, that will mean that all the rest operations on top of that will also struggle with this inefficiency. So obviously, this is not a way to do a queue. So, but the, the thing is, the only thing that we have before this is a list, right? So, so we, we can only do one sensible thing that we have we can, and we add a second list. And we build a queue from two lists. One will be at the front, and the second one will be rear. And the thing is, if you, if you, if you are confused how we will access the, the tail of the queue efficiently, then the thing is, the front list elements will be in the correct order. The rear list, the elements will be in the reversed order. So they are going back uh, with the last element is at the head of the rare list. And this makes it very interesting because now the enqueuing operations is super cheap. We just create a new, new queue, we reuse the front list, right? We reuse all the, all the elements in the front of the queue efficiently, and then to the real list, we just append one, one new head. And because that is the last element in the queue, the reverse the tail list is in the rarest order, and everything is good. So this is, this, is, this is cheap and nice and performant. So if we want to tail a queue, we will need to take all the elements except the first one. So we take all the elements from the first list except the first one, and the whole rear. So, and this is very nice because we, we just create objects, 
create new queues in the same way as we want it. We just modify the minimum and reusing the whole structure. So if we need to pick or a peek on what's in, in the head of the queue, we just take the front and see its head nice and easy uh, and also fast. So now we need to dequeue. And dequeue is a very cumbersome operation, especially in the functional setting, because, well, we need to remove something. Even if adding something to data structure is kind of easy and intuitive, you just add a new pointer and you say, oh, my new data structure is this, also pointing there, then removing might be much more troublesome. And first, we need to, to change the API because we, we provide, we cannot mutate the state of the existing queue, so we will need to get the result, the element from the queue, and we'll need to get the new version of the queue. So all the mutative operations in the functional data structure, on functional data structures, will use the same kind of signature when they return a tuple, which is just a, a series, a series of, of objects. The thing is, the original queue is not affected, but we have access to the original and the next version of the queue. So we have the persistence and immutability. So if we look at the code to how to actually remove this element from the queue, uh, this, this is pretty easy. So we return a tuple, and the first element will be the head of the queue. And the head of the queue is the head of the front list, which is easy. And the tail of the queue, the remaining, would be the whole queue except the first element. And we, we, we saw that, how to implement that using tail. So this is, this is really easy and nice. Now we have this conditional there. So if the queue is empty, we have to throw an exception. And this is indeed, like if the queue is empty, we cannot take the head of that. But what if not the whole queue is empty? Right? We have two lists, and they can be empty, and both of them can be empty. But what if the front is empty, but rear is not? So imagine we, we had a queue, and we pushed elements to the rear of the list. We pushed elements into the queue, and now the rear list is long, and then we dequeued elements from the, from the top, and now the front is empty. And the, the front is empty, and we cannot get the head because we, there is no head in an empty list. So we will need to maintain the invariant that if the front is empty, the rear is also empty. And this is a little bit hard to do because we need to be smart when we do that. So, but it's also easy. In a sense, we don't mutate the queues, right? We don't mutate the structures, we only create them. So the only place where we have to think about maintaining this environment is when we create a new queue. So in the constructor, duh. So when we create a queue out of two lists, and if we see that the front list is empty, we take the rear list and reverse it into the front. We reverse it because we need to make sure that the elements are in the correct order. And then we have the empty rear and then we'll have the front full of elements. And that will never change because this data structure is immutable. So when we create the new data structure after some dequeuing operations, we will still do the same. So we will maintain the invariant that, uh, that the front is empty means rear is empty. Now you have a, a, a decent question, but like, look, this reverse operation is expensive, right? It's linear. Can we, how can we like, dequeue things and then say, oh, this is still performant when we have linear operations? Well, the thing is that we have to think about amortized complexity. Imagine a queue where you have the front list with M elements and the rear with M elements. To reverse the rear and put it in front when we need that, we'll have to spend an O, big O, M uh, operations, right? So we'll have to traverse linearly the whole list but to get to the point where we need to do that, we will need to execute at least M dequeues because we will only do this operation when the front is empty. And to make the front empty, we'll have to execute M operations, which means that the amortized complexity of the dequeuing it will be still constant. How cool is that? So now we built out of the list, we built a very useful data structure, which is a queue. Now let's go really deep. 
how to build a map. And precisely how to build a map when you have a list and a queue. And we are not talking about the tree map. So out of the list, we, you can probably say that, oh, let's do a tree, a functional tree data structure, and we'll have this like, tree map analog, which is the, I don't know, self-balancing red, black tree or something, like a Java util tree map. I'm talking about hash maps. I'm talking about maps that are really efficient with put a get operations, basically running them in a constant time. Who has an idea how to build a map from a list and a queue? That's a, that's a very interesting topic, because I have no idea how to build a good hash map from a list in a queue. We'll need to employ different data structures, and there are many of them. Basically, almost anything that you have in, in the imperative data structure world has been researched how to implement that in a functional way. So to build a hash map, we will need a thing that is called HAMT, which is hash array mapped tree, which is like try. T-R-I-E, which is a prefix tree. And, and, and this is, it's kind of complex, and you'll have to ensure things, but it basically looks like that. So you have an array, and when you key something, you have a key and a value. When you have a key, you create a tree with multiple branches, and you take the parts of the key, and that part of the key determine into which branch you go. So at the node leaf of this tree is a value, but the key is decoded, is in, encoded in the pass from the root to that tree. And this is how you build a map. So the thing is, this tree can have only limited depth, right? Say your keys are 32-bit integers, and every time you decide, you look at the bit and you decide go left or right, bit, bit, based on 0 and 1. The, the depths of that tree could be only 32. So when you traverse that, your complexity will be big O of 32, which is linear, because that's how big O notation, uh, which is not linear, which is constant, because that's how big O notation works. And when you build a map, you use the same principles. And I won't show code, because building a, a hamt is actually pretty, pretty uh, many lines of code. But you use the same principles. When you mutate that structure, when you update your map, you utilize the same uh, tree structures that you have, and you just create the changed elements. And since there is only one pass to an element from the root, you just need to mutate, uh, not mutate, recreate this single pass, meaning that your implementation can still be efficient. It will create a little bit of a bit more objects that the imperative approach with immutable state, but this is a different question, and we'll need to look at the well actual benchmarks uh, and actual uses in a system to to reason if this penalty uh, is appropriate and acceptable or not. So. Functional data structures are not a new thing, and on the JVM you have multiple implementations, so the closures uh, uh, collections, uh, implementations, they are persistent data structures from maps to vectors to sequences to all that good stuff. So Scala has implementation of both mutable and immutable and persistent collections. Uh, this is all nice and, and good, but you've told me that you don't do Scala that much day to day. So luckily for us, those things and the implementation of those collections is available on the JVM as well. So there are a couple of libraries, but my my, what, what I like, what the library that I like, is Java Slang. And Java Slang really wanted, it, it was created to uh, increase the expressiveness of the Java language. And when Java 8 Lambdas arrived, they, they utilized that to provide implementations of many, many uh, persistent and fully functional data structures as well. So. The other library is, I think, PC Collections. Uh, you should maybe look into that if you are interested in how different implementations uh, work with the code. But we'll talk about Java, Java slang. And well, they, they implement the front rows probably see that. They implement a number of uh, 
immutable and functional collections, from lists to arrays to hash sets to link hash sets to hash map to try, which is a prefix tree, to what else? Iterators. Oh, the queues, obviously. Queues, and even more than that, the recent update to the JavaSlang implemented the priority queue. And priority queue is the kind of a queue which, where the elements are, uh, well, arranged according to their order, right? So you have, you have uh, on every update, potentially, you have to change the structure of your, of, your, of, of your queue, because if you add an element that has to go in the middle of the queue, uh, it's much harder to just prepending or appending that. So what I want to do, I want to look at the performance and the performance queue of the priority queue. Because, well, first of all, that is a very interesting, interesting uh, data structure, and it's very useful. So if you calculate distances using uh, Dijkstra, or uh, you, you do something else, uh, or you want just to sort values by putting them into the priority queue and then accessing them in the, in the order, in the sorted order, it's a very versatile data structure. So uh, using the words of Pitbull, which is a singer, Lesson talk about let's do it, which most maybe not the most uh, immediate choice for 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 inspiration, but those are the words to live by. So let's look at the benchmarks. Luckily, JavaSlang provides a module called JavaSlang benchmarks, and they are not extensive, right? So uh, if you want to use functional data structures or if you want to use JavaSlang in your project in your code, then you should definitely benchmark it yourself and actually see how it works and see how it works with, from within your application. And does it stress other components? Does it make life easier for you or not? But those uh, initial set of benchmarks that they have, for example, for the priority queue, they compare the performance of uh, multiple implementations from Scala and Scala Z to uh, priority queue that is available in the uh, JDK, JDK library. So, and the benchmarks are uh, more or less same. So they are written using the JMH, which is the tool to create benchmarks. And they initialize the container size because, well, we know that working with short collections could be very different from the performance of working with large collections. So they set up elements and they assign, they get the setup easily, and then they See, they have three groups of, of benchmarks. So the first one is uh, checking the NQ operations. And basically what they do, they insert all the operations in the collections. And the second one is a DQ operation, which is, mm, which is a little bit more complicated because dequeuing is a mutating operation. So we'll get the result back and we'll get the new version of the collection back. So we'll have to reassign the values, uh, the field values all the time within the loop. But dequeuing is just takes the collections filled with elements and takes them one by one. And they have the sorting benchmark where we they have the empty priority queue at first and then they uh, push the values in uh, in the randomized order, and then they take all the values out in using the DQ operations. So, and for all the implementations of different collections, uh, the code does exactly that. So, the results are actually fascinating. So, here is not the typical uh, JMH output as you might accustomed to see that, but this is the ratio between the throughput of operations on, say, Java mutable collections, which would be the priority queue, and Slang persistent collection, uh, the Slang, uh, Java Slang priority queue. So, and they're in three groups, and you can see that Java mutable collections are faster, uh, well, five times faster approximately than the persistent collections in Slang, and even Scala mutable collections are faster uh, by a factor than, than 
than persistent collections in Slang. Surprisingly, the persistent collections from Scala Z are slower than Java Slangs. And this is very interesting, and this is a really cool result to share. I don't want to say that Scala Z persistent collection limitations uh, are slow, uh, but the results of those executing those benchmarks for, say, priority queue, and I didn't run much others because it would be uh, possible to, to explain all of those. So the Slang priority queue, which is a complex data structure, but it's a, it's a functional, immutable, persistent data structure, it, not very scientifically speaking, might be around five times slower than the mutable implementation of, of the same collection, or three times slower of that collection in Scala, or a little bit faster than Scala Z version of that, which is a very reasonable result. You, you get this number, uh, given that this is a benchmark that is not even run on the presentation, but I'm just showing you results. Uh, you should take that with a grain of salt, uh, maybe with a big bag of salt. But this is interesting. You should. Uh, if you will look into that and you will run benchmarks, uh, you will get some idea of how, how performant the collections are uh, and if it makes sense for you to, to go with them. So in a sense, just uh, to finish this off, uh, this is a kind of little bit cheesy tweet that has been used many, many times. The object-oriented paradigm makes code understandable by encapsulating the moving parts. We encapsulate the global state, and we try not to touch it that much. The functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing the moving parts. So we'll try to, we try to make things immutable. We try to make things per persistent. That helps a lot with reasoning about concurrency uh, and reasoning about what is happening in the implementation. For some use cases, that is perfect, especially for value objects where the objects do not have the exact identity, they just have, well, the value. Uh, this is really good. If you have objects with identities, uh, maybe that is not as, uh, as easy to reason about those then. But minimizing moving parts is a very sensible way of trying to uh, conquer the complexity of the underlying problems. So if you want to know more, uh, this, the entry point should probably be this uh, book, Purely Functional Data Structure by Chris uh, Okasaki. It was written in uh, 1998, and it, it, it goes through all the reasons, the actually, well, scientific explanation of why we need lazy evaluation to make the uh, functional collections uh, performant, why we need uh, different things, how we restructure the the collections, how we design those uh, elements. And it's a great book uh, to, to, to look at. Two years, late, uh, two years before that, he wrote his doctoral thesis on the, same, on the same subject. But in those two years, he added something to the book. So I would go with the book if I were you, and if I would want to know uh, in there. And I just cannot not recommend this visiting this link. So this is the link to Stack Overflow uh, question and answer. What is, what is new in purely funct functional data structure since Okasaki? And in those, well, almost 20 years since, uh, since the book was published, there has been a lot of progress. And that answer is one of the most extensive Stack Overflow answers I have ever seen. So if you go into that, uh, there is descriptions with, with the progress and links to different collections and uh, different articles about things. And you'll learn about finger trees and the zippers and about int maps and, and the science behind that. Uh, and it's a, if, you, if you are interested, this is maybe the easiest way to proceed from there. Uh, so yeah, this is it. So I'm out of time, so we have half a minute. If you have any questions, uh, find me and chat with me. Where we have 20 seconds, I'm not sure if they will kick me out of stage after that. Maybe we'll have time for questions. Do you have any questions? So, why I haven't seen it uh, in benchmark normal Scala immutable collections? Because I thought there, there were Scala Z collections, Scala mutable, but they were missing with, I would 
say direct competitions in Scala, Scala so the question is that in the benchmark there was a uh, Scala mutable collection implementation benchmark, but was Scala uh, persistent collection implementation was not benchmarked. Uh, this is a good question. I have no good answer to that. Uh, that benchmark is is uh, embedded into the Java slang repository, uh, and they add well. So take that with two grains of salt because that is kind of like vendor benchmark, but. Uh, that is open source. That's available on GitHub. You can check it out. You can add there's just one collection. They have the Scala library available as a dependency there. So just add that, run the code, and see what the numbers are. I would be really interested in learning uh, if there is any kind of sketchy, sketchy misinformation there. I don't think so. I think it's an honest, uh, just a mission, uh, not not very intentional. But you should look into that. So now we are officially out of time. Uh, I will turn off the mic. Uh, if you have any further questions, please find me. Thank you.